Thank you, Nate. We're going to begin our thoughts in 1 Kings chapter 12, the story of uh, Rehoboam's mistake. And we're going to read verses 1 through 16 of 1 Kings chapter 12. But before we do, I'm going to suggest that for those that know that this term, there is a chiasm in the structure of how the narrative is laid out for us in verses 1 through 16 of 1 Kings chapter 12. And very briefly, if you're not familiar with the term uh, like a Bible chiasm, it's where the way that the, the word is written and the story is told in such a way that there is a focal point in the middle of the story. And everything from beginning to end works in parallel and matches to bring us progressively to the middle. And, there, and there's an important point or lesson or there is some value in identifying the central point of the chiasm. And the analogy I, I like to use for what this is, it's like, a, it's like a sandwich where you have your bread layer on the outside. Then you have your, your condiment layer underneath that. Then there's like your vegetable, lettuce, tomato layer. And finally, you get to the very middle, the center of the sandwich or the chiasm, and it's the turkey or the ham. And so you refer to the sandwich not as a lettuce and mustard sandwich or not as a a bread and mayonnaise sandwich. You call it a turkey sandwich. The goal of the whole sandwich is to get that turkey inside of you. And so the point of the Bible chiasms is to get us to that focal point to have something be taught for us from the narrative. So I'm going to suggest as you read verses 1 through 16, see if you can spot a little bit of a structure here, and there will be a lesson. When I, when I learned of this chiasm, it changed my perception of the lesson of Rehoboam. So 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 1 through 16. It says, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. So what happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it, he was still in the presence of King Solomon and had been dwelling in Egypt, that they sent and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and we will serve you. So he said to them, Depart from me from three days, then come back to me. And the people departed. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived, and he said, How do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to these people today, and serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him, and consulted the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. And he said to them, What advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father put on us. Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall speak to these people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. Then the king answered the people roughly, and rejected the advice which the elders had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So the king did not listen to the people, For the turn of events was from the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Now when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to your own house, O David." Okay, so a story we're all very familiar with and have heard this lesson before about Rehoboam's mistake in his decision. And some of you may be aware of the structure already of this chapter, but when I, when I encountered it, it really sort of rearranged how I viewed this lesson. And so I'll suggest that this is the chiastic structure of this story, that it begins in verse 1 and ends in verse 16 with all Israel being assembled to begin with, to consult Rehoboam, and then in verse 16, when they decide to really rebel and they're upset with Rehoboam, all Israel is referred to in verses 1 and 16. 
Then in in verses 2 and verse 15, we have the presence of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, as the leader who brought the people against Rehoboam in verse 2, and then as sort of the beginning of the rebellion in verse 3, as the person who would lead them away from Rehoboam. In verses 3 and 4, and also in verses 13 and 14, is the presentation of the problem, where the people in verses 3 and 4 told Rehoboam, hey, your, your father put this heavy yoke upon us, And in verses 13 and 14, the king repeats that this was done to them when he gives them their answer. In verses 5 and 12 is sort of the setup of the story, how Rehoboam says, I'm going to take three days, come back to me in three days. And then verse 12 is after the third day, they then come back and they speak with Rehoboam. And so then we have on either side of what really is the center of the chiasm is on one hand, Rehoboam consulting the elders first. In verses 6 through 7, he consults the old men for their advice. And likewise, in verses 9 through 11, he consults the young men and consults his friends. But what's in the middle, what is the central point of this story, is that Rehoboam rejected the elders' advice. Now, you might be saying, Mike, we already knew that. But if you picture now the reason for this being the center of the story, and I think I have two more arrows there, is that if this is the focal point, if this is the fulcrum on which the whole story hinges and oscillates, is his rejection of the elders, it means that everything in the first half matches the second half. And what happened in the first half obviously happened before the second half, which means that Rehoboam's rejection of the elders came before he consulted with the young men. And I always sort of thought that Rehoboam This is maybe a misperception on my part. He talked to the elders, talked to the young men, weighed out the pros and cons, and he unfortunately chose the old men, or did not choose the old men's idea. He went with his friends, the young men. But this uh, chiasm shows us that the problem Rehoboam made was not that he made the wrong decision in choosing one over the other, but that he really didn't make a decision at all. He just rejected outright the elders' advice. He did not really fully consider it. Because if you look at verse 8, It says, he rejected the advice which the elders had given him and then consulted the young men. What other choice at that point would he have? He rejected the old men's advice, and so therefore whatever the young men would say was going to be his answer. The problem with Rehoboam was not that he made a bad choice between two options, was that he only gave himself one option, and he rejected the wrong course, and the chiasm shows this for us. And this is like the classic lesson of the Old Testament, of how critical it is for us to heed the advice of elders. And if anyone who outright rejects the wisdom of an older person in their life, they've made a mistake if they do not put weight and care into it. And the New Testament picks up this lesson for us. 1 Timothy 5, verse 17 says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. And Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7 says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, and he will show you. Your elders, and they will tell you. And so the advice here in the law of Moses, even as as far back in the Bible, is that we can't make the mistake of Rehoboam. We've got to go out of our way to consult elders and get the advice from our fathers, from our grandfathers. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, it's Peter writes, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. And so in the Ecclesia, it, it's, obviously it's one thing that the wrong choice is to just reject what elders have to say. But the message of this verse here is that quite the opposite. We actually really should value and embrace and elevate the wisdom of elders, not simply not dismiss it, but actually give it priority and make it important. And this really is a huge challenge for us now, gave it away too soon, a huge challenge for us now entering the year 2019 and the day in which we live, where we see in the Bible that we need to prioritize the wisdom of our elders and not reject it. But yet there's a real challenge that I think is specific to this generation. Obviously, throughout the course of time, it's always been a difficult thing 
for wisdom to diffuse and sort of spread from elder to younger. I'm not saying it's ever really been easy for wisdom to be passed down. And I'm sure every generation would say, oh, you know, those old people, they're out of touch. What do they have to offer us? It's been a challenge for everyone as far back in, in biblical times. But for us in our day and age, there is an additional barrier. There is an additional wrinkle that makes this critical lesson even more difficult to apply in our lives. And I would suggest we can see it in this uh, survey done by Nielsen two years ago in 2017, asking the question, does technology make my life easier? And millennials, and if you're, if you're not quite sure on the, the terms here, millennials be people about, about my age and down to say maybe age 20 or so, uh, they overwhelmingly said yes. Three-fourths of millennials embrace technology as part of their lives. Gen X, which would be people sort of in their 40s and 50s, if you will, they said uh, one third, yes, you know, technology is okay. One third, embrace it. But then the baby boomers, sort of my, my parents' age, the uh, sort of like the grandparents right now, under 20% said yes. And so the additional wrinkle our generation has in our ecclesia at this point in time is that there is a different world in which young people operate and conduct their business from the world in which older folks and grandparents operate and conduct their business. And technology makes it even harder for us to bridge the gap and allow wisdom to be passed down from grandparent to parent to child to grandchild. Now, I'll speak anecdotally, and I'm sure a lot of you will probably resonate, and you can think of it in your own lives, of where some of these gaps are and some of these barriers are. And one of the big ones is how we're living more and more in a paperless world. And we use our devices and tablets and computers to store information and files and data and records and intellectual property. And it's all now being put out in the cloud. And at work, like we're paperless and I don't use paper at my work hardly at all. But in the Ecclesia, you might go to a Bible class and the speaker gives you a printed out packet of 18 pages and I say, well, what, what is this? I, I, I have no place for this. I, I don't read these papers anymore. And I'm not saying one is, is good or evil. I'm not saying that the young people are wrong and the old people got it right or the old, old people have it wrong and the young people have it right. One, one isn't better than the other. It's just they're different. And so a generation that grew up printing things out and have file cabinets full of paper, they, that's how they function. And it's so different from young people who have everything, oh, my phone's over there, they have everything now in the palm of their hand and they don't print out anything. I still have the printer I had 20 years ago because I only ever print out a few pages very seldomly throughout the year. And so there's things like this. Just printing is only one sort of small example of how there's different mediums and ways that our generations operate, which makes bridging this gap all the more difficult. Uh, One of the survey respondents to Nielsen, this was uh, in part of the the further pages of the report, she was referencing how she does communicate or interface with older people. And I thought this quote was really revealing. She said, I communicate with my parents on Facebook. Now, the reason that's so so striking is that you would think that Facebook, okay, your, your grandparents got on Facebook, they're sort of in your world. Isn't that the way it should go? But even Facebook now is viewed as the old and out of date and antiquated system. And this chart I put together here really shows how young people, they're so far ahead of even my generation and how they interact with each other. And I'm not saying it's good or bad, it's just different. So we got the older folks, the baby boomers and Gen X, a lot of traditional phone calls, things printed out. They exchange phone numbers and read books, but Gen Z and millennials, it's all now texting and apps and Snapchat and Instagram. And back in the day, if you will, if you were interested in someone of the opposite gender, you asked for their number. Now young people ask for their other person's Snapchat or Instagram. This is just the world in which they live. And people used to be grow up with books and reading things printed out. Now everything is on a screen, everything's digital and out in the cloud. So how do we deal with this? How do we overcome this? Where the message of the Bible is that we should not only not just sort of put off and discard our elders' advice because it's valuable, 
but we really should embrace it and enhance it. How do we do it if young people aren't even interfacing with our elders because they're in a totally different world online? I think it's, it's a real challenge for us to face. I've got a few suggestions. One is that young people, and I'm going to sort of lump myself in with this group, we need to try our best to see past technology and look at all the other aspects of life in which elders have expertise and wisdom to share. The, the problem I need, I need to overcome in the example of the printed out packets or pieces of paper is that the teacher for that class had a great message to share. It was a really, really good class. But in my own mind, I was sort of thrown off at the very beginning because of the paper thing. I need to let that go. And I need to view the wisdom of elders as a valuable thing, even if the medium on which it comes across is foreign to me. And likewise, we should try to facilitate uh, events or get-togethers or whatever this looks like where the medium no longer is important. I call it a you know, joint territory here. We need to try to develop opportunities for young people and elders to actually get together and talk where it isn't online, and it, it maybe isn't an old way either, where it's, something's printed out or it's, it's an old-fashioned presentation. I, we don't need to have old people like dishing out pamphlets, but we also don't need to have young people saying, you have to meet me online. There has to be places in our ecclesia where all generations can gather and share and discuss. And perhaps a study day like this, where we're all together in one room and we're all eating the same meal and sharing the same breaks, perhaps now is a great opportunity to let some of that wisdom diffuse down from an older generation. A few more suggestions. This one, with, with, with the, the most care and love and, and, and proper respect I can give, if an, the ecclesia is going to have a technology as part of its, its basic functioning, elders should try as best they can, and maybe some can't, and, and that's okay, we should try to develop some competency if the ecclesia is going to use this. And so this is a sort of a very real discussion about how we use PowerPoint and how we use computers and laptops to record and present and share content in the ecclesia. And we have to respect if some, if some brothers or sisters, they say, I'm just not technological, I need to do it the old way, and I'm just gonna speak from notes or I'm just gonna share thoughts with you via conversation, we, we should, as young people, embrace that and see that even though it isn't our preferred medium, there is incredible value and benefit to interfacing with our elders in that way. But if our elders are going to try to use PowerPoint or to use slides, please try to be somewhat minimally competent with it because nothing throws off a young person more than just seeing a brutal, sloppy PowerPoint presentation where it's just ugly and you can't pay attention to it. The standard has been raised at our schools and in our workplaces that presentations have to be crisp. And we can't have that in the ecclesia because, again, it's a different world and our young people are going to struggle with it. And finally, young people, nonetheless, this really is a message for us, we need to go out of our way and try to find ways to interact with our elders. That, that might mean you're not going to find them on Snapchat and Instagram. Maybe you use Facebook for this. I wouldn't suggest it. We may actually, actually have to actually have a conversation and talk with an elder. And once again, I'm going to speak anecdotally. I look back at when I was a young person. So go back to the 90s, back when I was, say, age 17 through 24, and such critical faith formation in my life took place, as it did for a lot of other young people, at Uncle Roy Stiles' house for mutual improvement classes on Monday nights. And that was such an immensely valuable time for the wisdom of, of this particular brother and those that were there to pass on advice and counsel and wisdom to us who were the young people back then. And we need to try to develop opportunities like that now. I, I, I'm trying to think, and I, I'm not sure if it exists, I know there is an effort coming this fall for like a Saturday morning like Bible discussion session for people in the CYC and for elders in the Ecclesia to get together and discuss. These are the kind of events that I suggest are currently absent and that we need to bring back into our Ecclesia 
because right now technology is separating us and we should go out of our way to make those opportunities very real. They were so critical for me as a young man to have Uncle Roy and, you know, and Grandpa Ray and Grandpa John, and you can name all the names. They were a part of our lives, and we learned so much from them. But is that happening now in, in our current ecclesial environment? And if it isn't, we really should bring it back because it was so huge. For the people now who are like Gen X and Millennials, we had that. Now Gen Z needs it more than ever. So as we enter our five-minute break discussion, these are two questions to think about. What prevents young people from respecting and valuing the wisdom of elders, and how do we overcome that? And how do we bridge the communication gap caused by technology? And before I sit down, these two questions, I would suggest really should be focused to people my age and younger to the, the young people in, in the Arclesial environment, I think it's really up to us to go out of our way as best we can to reach out and discuss with our elders. These two questions are questions for us to take away and discuss. But let's spend five minutes and I'll talk about it right now. Thank you.
All right, welcome back, uh, everyone. And by the way, thank you for such lively discussion during the chats. I was a little bit worried it wouldn't work out, but I think it was a, a good thing to, to try. So now we're going to come to our last session uh, for today, uh, session six. I'd like us to begin in Judges chapter two for this session. <clears throat> Judges chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 7 through 10, this being about the, the end of, of Joshua's life and the legacy he left. Judges chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at timnath Heres in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gesh. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. How could this be? Joshua was such a faithful warrior for the Lord and led the people in such a fantastic manner for so many years, and the generation with him seemed to have done a lot of really good things, and while they were alive, the nation was in a great place. But how is it even possible that the very next generation not just made some mistakes or fell off a little bit, but did not know the Lord? They did not know him or his works. How could that have possibly been? Well, for whatever reasons, for whatever reason why the next generation was not taught about God and did not know God, we all know what happened in the rest of the book of Judges, where what proceeds is a series of follies and mistakes and, and ups and downs, where it's all sort of categorized as the people doing what was right in their own eyes. They all thought what they were doing was right, but we look back in hindsight, and it was just a colossal debacle because they weren't taught about God. They did not know him. How could this possibly be? And so as the story of the Bible continues on, and a few generations later, and the Psalms are being put together, perhaps the people of Israel collectively learned this lesson and saw the mistakes because the Psalms, actually as a bit of a side note, the book of Psalms by far uses the word generation more than any other book. 35 times in second place isn't even close. So the words of the Psalms have a very clear focus for us, amongst many things, but one being about teaching the next generation. And so Psalm 48, verse 13 says, Mark well her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generation following. Psalm 71, verse 18, Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation your power to everyone who is to come. So in this verse here, the psalmist asks for strength, not for any other reason, but to enable him to teach the next generation and to those who are to come, that he could pass on the knowledge of God to the next wave of believers. And Psalm 102, verse 18, this will be written to the, for the generation to come, that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. So the Psalms, for whatever primary purpose it had in praising God in this particular Psalm, a secondary benefit was that it could be passed on to the next wave of, or generation of those to come. Come with me, please, to Psalm 78. I'm going to put it up on the overhead here, but I also just want to read it out of my Bible. Psalm 78, verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> really sort of hammers the point home here repeatedly for us. Psalm 78. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. 
so this psalm describes for us how there's this chain of knowledge and praise of God passed on from fathers to the current generation. And the hope of this psalm is to pass it on to the next generation that they can then teach it to their children. And so the, the point is really hammered home for us that we have a responsibility to pass the torch on to the next generation. We can't make the mistake that was made in Joshua's generation. Amongst all the great works of faith being done, somehow the children were not taught to know God. We can't make the same mistake. And in, even in the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, this verse describes the group effort needed to teach. And the things that you have heard from me, this is Paul writing to Timothy, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So Paul taught Timothy and now suggests that Timothy, will you teach others? And then those people, they, they can also teach. And that's really a model for ecclesial life that we really all should be trying to teach and passing on through whatever abilities that we have the next generation. We should assemble groups and have Sunday school teachers and exhorters and and everyone with capabilities should be trying to teach and pass on the knowledge of God. Now, why is this particularly challenging in 2019? Well, we all know how our attention spans are shortening and how there's just so much that's out there, as we discussed in previous classes. And there's just so much digital content now that is constantly vying for and competing to grab our attention. And the difficulty and challenge that we have in the modern world is that for every opportunity that we have to teach, there's just so many other temptations to learn and have entertainment from other avenues. It's never been more difficult to capture a young person's attention. And I'm as guilty as any of that there's these media companies out there. And as we speak right now, I'm not going to give a commercial for them, but they are all right now in an extremely intense industry war. They are all fighting for market share. They're all spending way above their incoming revenue to try to fight each other out of this online streaming digital content space to become the dominant champion of online uh, entertainment consumption. And the budgets that these companies are spending just in one particular year to generate more digital content is staggering. Netflix is spending $13 billion, Amazon Prime $5 billion, and right now Hulu is only spending $2 billion, but with the coming uh, joint force of Disney Plus plus Hulu, They are projecting to spend over $20 billion in future years on content. And how could you even consider what the monetary value of YouTube is and just how much in in a thousand lifetimes you couldn't watch all the videos posted on YouTube? And these uh, content avenues, if you will, these streaming services are now available 24-7. They're available all the time. And they're in in a life and death struggle with each other for our attention and our viewership. And how much more difficult does that make it for us to teach and find our ways of sharing the knowledge of God with the next generation? Because they're growing up with this as children and teenagers. We as adults are facing it, and it's difficult for us as well, isn't it? But this is the only world that they, our next generation, will have known. The rare opportunities that we have to teach we have to capitalize on because we are now just one of many, many very resource-blessed players that that are just just trying so hard, fighting for our, our generation's attention. Now, as I mentioned in a previous class, what we have as believers, as those who possess the word of God, is a priceless pearl of great price. For billions and billions of dollars, you could not buy the hope of God's coming kingdom. The Bible is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's a resource that no one could replace or overcome or find a better alternative to. But the problem is now is that for as powerful as the Bible is and as, as absolutely valuable as it is to us and we treasure it, it is difficult for us in this day and age to get the Bible printed on paper and in text out there into the minds and into the, the, the learning areas of the next generation's brain. This is a, 
an interesting series of slides to come here about a new form of entertainment or, so I would say, of digital consumption called a podcast, which I'm sure we've probably all heard of or are aware of. And this chart here shows the progression of podcast use over the past you know, 50, 10, 15 years or so. And we've jumped over a threshold now in the year 2019, where now over half the population of America now consume, listen, view podcasts. It's believed by this media group, Infinite Dial, that 144 million Americans now consume podcasts or will in the year 2019. And another piece of interesting information came out of the same research group. They found that the average amount of podcasts being viewed per week by a typical person is five. Some do 11 or more. Some is just one or two. But the point is people tend to view a lot of podcasts. And I think this data shows for us that there's really sort of, in our modern world, two kinds of people. You're probably either someone who doesn't listen to podcasts at all, or you're someone who listens to a bunch of podcasts. There seem to be sort of two extremes. And so it, it asks the question for us, if there's just all of this attention and effort being put into putting out entertainment and education and things in other forms online, how do we, as a faith-based community, based on the Bible, how do we still find ways to reach the next generation when there is just so much competition for their time? Now, I'm going to suggest three things. This was just, just my own opinion and take, and feel free to discuss this in our, in our chat sessions. I can see that we're at a crossroads here as a society, and I think there's three paths that are maybe worth discussing and thinking about. Oh, I forgot this slide here. Yeah, so interesting information that two-thirds of podcast viewers are under age 45, and really about half are in their mid-30s and, and under. So it's really also a generational thing, how it tends to be that the young people, and from like millennials down, we're the ones that are really sort of podcast-hungry and really listen to a lot. Okay, so I have three suggestions, and here's the first one. And this is one that I think a lot, there's a lot of merit to, that we need to try as best we can, and this is, again, this is sort of mission impossible, and probably something that parents are already trying their best to achieve, is to try our best to minimize the exposure of our young people to such online content, particularly at, at younger ages, to try our best to get the screens off, get the online content shut down as, as best we can, minimize it, and manage it. You might cite verses like, you know, if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. Maybe a family has to find some way to pluck out the otherwise unstoppable stream of online content. This is going to be a very difficult one, but I think it's worth discussing as, as a family or as believers discussing this option. The second one, though, and I think this is going to be very true no matter what, no matter what you decide, is that when we do have the young people's attention and the next generation is focused on us, when we're there on a Sunday morning and the parents have got the, the devices off and you're in your seat and the young people are listening to an exhortation, it's got to be worth their time. It really has got to be good and crisp. They have to learn something. There has to be a valuable lesson. They can't nod off. We've got to make our, t our classes, our talks, our exhortations worthwhile. It's no longer okay to sit back and just get by with a mediocre exhortation and have a lost opportunity because the attention span now is so quick that teenagers will not listen if, if it's a brutal exhortation. We have to make it good. We have to value their time. Bible classes must be worthwhile. And this is an important one as well. Regular teaching at home is very important. I, th I think it'd be unrealistic to ask a young person or ask a child to be sure to pay attention now, put your cell phone away and put your tablet away and pay attention now on Sunday if they are not practicing that all the other days of the week. If the family is not coming together and turning things off and, and learning from the readings or from whatever the Bible the class or discussion might be in the family, how is it going to then all of a sudden be different on Sunday? And also, we also need to address how nowadays there is so much more attention on online content being paid to the different ways 
that people learn. Some people are great at auditory learning, and that's typically the, the, the usual strength of a Christadelphian talk is it's somebody at the front talking and lecturing, and auditory learners thrive in that, in that mode. But now there are so many online videos, and you can think of videos of where like, you see a person's hands crafting a recipe, and you can actually see it and picture your own hands doing it. These are powerful ways that the internet is really taking advantage of kinesthetic learners or people who learn through actually thinking, visualizing, or doing it with their hands. And we as Christadelphians, we should be trying to embrace these new methods of reaching a person's mind and perhaps involving more visuals to grab our attention and also find ways to actually get people busy and active. This might be more workshops or discussion sessions or practical discussions. There must be ways for us to, to achieve or to reach the minds of kinesthetic learners, people who learn in different ways besides just listening to someone talking. And third, and I realize this is going to be sort of a difficult contradiction, but I do wonder if we as Christadelphians also, if there's all of this digital content out there and it's going to be consumed, it's there for us, if we should actually have more of our discussions and talks and message be put online. I, I realize that number one and number three sort of stand juxtaposed to each other, and how can you pursue both at the same time? Maybe different people in different situations need one of these two things. Maybe as, as a family, you need to pursue item number one and just try to reduce the online temptation. Or maybe certain adults or single people or, or older folks where they don't have children around and they're online and they have their phones and there's a lot, a lot of good stuff that actually is out there in podcasts. It isn't all bad or evil or wicked. Maybe we should be trying, though, to put faith-based things out there, speak about the Christadelphians, our beliefs, what our lives are like, encouragement to each other. Maybe there should also be more Christadelphian work and content online so it isn't just YouTube and Netflix. It can also be things for good, things that help us. And so with that, I'd like to actually maybe get a little bit real here and address how this is already happening and to some degree the toothpaste is out of the tube, and I think it's a really good thing that there are successful Christadelphian podcasts, and the numbers are perhaps not what you might think. There's a lot of people listening to these good Christadelphian talks. I think they posted they've had over 10,000 people download or listen to a particular class or podcast they've posted. And some of you may not know all of these, but this is one I listened to from two brothers up in uh, Kingston, Ontario. This is Sam Taylor's podcast. This is Tim Young's podcast. He talks about first principles and life and the truth with other brothers from Book Road. And this is the podcast that's on um, Pete and Carly's site, magnifyhimtogether.com. And they have end of the week encouragement podcasts. And people are really listening to this. And in an online space that is so crowded with other things that are out there for us to view and watch and listen to, if, if the numbers are there that this is happening, we maybe should produce more of our own online content. Perhaps the days of pamphlets and flyers is over, and the days for podcasts is now here, and we should be producing this and putting this out there in the world. I realize this is a, a difficult subject for all of us, and some of you might be saying, Mike, I disagree. We should be trying to fight this. We should resist all of this online content out there, and so you might suggest or support number one. And there's a lot of validity to that, and I completely agree. But the reality of 2019 is that it's, it's, it's all around us all the time, and it's a part of our lives. We should at least try to make it faith-based, to make it Christadelphian. Some of you may say, Mike, this is a great thing. We should do this. Others might say it's a compromise. It's, this is for us to discuss and to I think, would take some time to think about how do we teach the next generation how do we avoid the mistake of Joshua? How do we follow the words of the Psalms? I think it's going to be a combination of all three of these things. And so for our, our discussion and meditation questions as we conclude our study for the day is what things should our ecclesia do to take advantage of the precious time that we have with an audience of young people? And there are some sub-questions here. Should our best teachers and exhorters speak more and perhaps even publish their studies online? 
Should we have an all ages mutual improvement class? So all exhorters, all teachers, all speakers, we're constantly trying to improve the quality of our talks because the level of competition around us has risen so dramatically. And C, are there other ways for us to improve the quality of our teaching and involve new techniques and new methods to reach different kinds of learners and different people who in a digital age are so used to visualizing things and seeing things on a screen, whereas listening now can become a bit of a chore. And finally, if you subscribe to suggestion number three, would you consider producing online spiritual content like a podcast or an online journal or artwork or just consult magnifyhimtogether.com and all these ways that Christadelphians in a digital world are helping to share things and encourage each other if this is the world that we have to live in until Christ returns. So there's definitely, I think, some really serious things for us to discuss here. And so we'll take five minutes and we'll see you at the end of that.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Just before I hand things back over to Nader, uh, Brother Billington from Brantford also shared with me that there's another podcast called Bible in the News, available on BibleInTheNews.com or on iTunes. So th- there's a lot of good prophecy out to share through that, that podcast as well. So it's, I think it's an avenue worth exploring. Uh, but with that, I'll hand it over to Nader now to, uh, to close things out.